Good afternoon, Jim. Thanks for joining us. I'm Lucinda Bryden. I work in the alumni office here at SUNY Delhi, and we're about four minutes past the hour, so I think we will go and get started. I wanted to thank um, two of our faculty members, and one of them is an alumna, um, put today's presentation together for us. Uh, Brigitta Brophy and Julia Ward are both faculty in what now is known as our Golf and Plant Sciences program. And they really did a nice job putting together a variety of tips for us today. Um, I hope you enjoy it. If you do have any questions, um, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, the faculty um, are not online with us today, um, but I promised that I would forward any questions to them after the presentation and we'd be happy to get back to you folks um, if you have a burning question that you would like to ask them about um, any of the topics today or something else um, that crosses your mind in terms of gardening. Um, and with that said, I'm going to get the video underway, and thanks again for being here. Good afternoon, and welcome to our virtual presentation on how to winterize your garden. We are so happy to have you join us on this fact and picture-filled presentation on some of the key preventive and proactive steps you can take in preparing your yard from the wrath of winter. But before we begin, let us introduce ourselves. My name is Brigitte Brophy, and I am an associate professor in the Golf and Plant Sciences area. For those of you who don't know me, I am a registered landscape architect by profession and a wannabe organic gardener back home. Through the better part of my life, I had played in the dirt, first off with flowers, then landscapes, and now more with vegetables. I have taught at Delhi since the fall of 1997 and enjoy teaching the next generation of our environmental stewards. Hello, good afternoon. I am Julia Ward and am an alumni myself of SUNY Delhi and of the program. I have been here for over 12 years as the instructional support technician where I teach and assist in many of our hands-on labs. I am a landscaper and golf course assistant by profession and enjoy getting dirty, making things look better, and love what I do and love sharing my knowledge and experiences with others. So I'm super excited you decided to join us today. To preface this presentation, we would like to let you know that this information is for guidance purposes only. What works for us here in Delaware County may not be the best advice for those of you that live in, say, like Florida, but hopefully that is obvious. Local climate and plant materials should be considered for your particular landscape. If you are not certain as to the best materials or approaches to take, it may be wise to contact your local extension office and ask. Hopefully though, this presentation will provide you with some direction in protecting the plants that are near and dear to you. So in this presentation, we will give you a Reader's Digest version of various winterization topics. We each have a topic to cover and we'll switch out per topic. Forget it. Will you start us out? I think we're ready to get the show on the road. Our first topic will be the winter protection of trees and shrubs. In this illustration, I'd like to share with you ways in which we can protect some of our tender woody plants. The idea that we can protect the plants from some of the drying winds as well as the temperature changes that happen between the warmer days and the very cold nights can sometimes allow us to overwinter plants that might be borderline in our yards. Say for instance, in Delaware County here, it's not very easy to grow hybrid tea roses, although people can do it, but they are then providing these plants with the extra insulative qualities they need by either covering them A with some leaves or some straw. And that's what we're illustrating here is we've got these chicken um, wire surrounds, uh, some of them staked with some wooden stakes and filled either with the leaves or the straw, as you can see here. And these are very useful uh, when the springtime comes and you are no longer um, worried about the very cold temperatures and the fluctuations in temperatures. It is a good idea to take these off as soon as possible because they also um, hold in a certain amount of moisture and it'll allow once the sun is hitting the plants to start growing again. The illustration on the right hand side is 
providing a little bit of uh, plastic covering to minimize the moisture in the straw, and that might be specific to the plant that is being covered in that particular situation. Some plants suffer from winter burn. Winter burn is caused by windy winter conditions that remove water from leaves. Evergreens, and whether they be needled or broadleaf evergreens such as these, are very vulnerable in that the water leaving the leaves typically will exceed the plant's ability to absorb water from dry and frozen soils. So in situations like this, we are going to be concerned with either A, minimizing the amount of winds that are going to be buffeting our plants, or B, providing moisture during the times of the year when the ground isn't frozen. Um, this is all very important in minimizing or preventing this winter burn. Here are some additional examples of winter burn on plants. On the bottom left-hand corner, you see some holly plants that are showing signs of winter burn on especially their tops and uh, not so much on their sides. So my feeling is that there might have been some snow that protected the bottoms of those plants and the tops were the pieces that were exposed to the wind and therefore experienced the winter burn. On the middle upper portion, upper uh, illustration here, we have the arborvitaes and you can see the winter burn specifically on the area that it was most exposed to the winds. The uh, far side of those plants look green and lush, and they were protected by the windward side of the plant. And the same thing is holding true on the bottom right-hand corner. There was some type of wind damage that was uh, affecting that side of the plant. And here you have a picture that shows an untreated plant as opposed to a treated plant. And it looks to be that those these are both uh, newly planted, newly established plants, and obviously um, we're trying to promote the use of these anti-desiccants <laughs> with this slide. Another way in which we can prevent moisture loss is actually giving the plants a little bit of a blanket, covering them. Um, the covering will minimize the winds, it will minimize also the temperature fluctuations under those coverings. And here we have uh, for the first uh, and the second slide some natural burlap which is pinned to the plants. You don't want it too tight and uh, suffocating the plant. You want it loosely wrapped, but yet covering the entire plant and secured enough so that the wind isn't gonna blow it off. On the right-hand side, we have a um, nylon type of burlap, which is also very satisfactory. What I wanna also point out with all of these, uh, these pictures here is that the covering is of a light color. Do not cover your plant with something that's dark, which will work as more of a way in which the plant is going to warm up when the sun beats on it and then even enhance those freeze thaws, the, the drastic temperatures that might happen. So reflective and light colored coverings are going to be preferred. Here we have only partial covering, but the covering is on the windward side of the plants. And obviously this might be a little bit easier to do, it's not using as much material and effective. What you see here are smaller plants, and smaller plants are going to be, again, if they're recently planted or they're new to that area and not very well established, more sensitive. Once these plants get a little larger, there's a good chance that they'll be more resilient and acclimated to the climate. But there might be some plants that you'll have to do this every year to. Now is also a great time to prevent damage from grazing deer. You can see on the left-hand side the damage that deer did. Um, it might have happened over the course of only one night and it is very devastating because once this damage occurs it is very difficult if almost impossible to uh, for the plants to recuperate from something like this. So now is a good time if um, you haven't done so already to make plans to be able to provide the protection of your sensitive plants from deer grazing. Spray-on deer deterrents are one method in which you can prevent deer from browsing on your valuable landscape plants. And these spray-on deterrents act in a number of ways. One in which a, the spray actually has very strong and distasteful ingredients in it, um, something like garlic and hot peppers. Another would be a spray that has the smells of a predator 
Um, oftentimes these sprays will include urine, say from the animals of lions and tigers. And although those lions and tigers are not native to America, the deer do recognize the urine fragrances as being something that came from a predator. And another form of a spray deterrent would be something that is very strong smelling, whether it be um, as far as a, a good smell or even something that's a putrid smell. One of the items that needs to be mentioned with the, the fragrances of some of these uh, sprays is that they are not only uh, detectable by animals, but they're also detectable by humans. So uh, you may want to see what you're spraying and how close it is to your house or where you have to walk by on a regular basis. Another item that needs to be mentioned about the sprays is that they will need reapplication at certain points during the winter time, especially after rains. Uh, they do wash off and probably have an expectancy of about four to six weeks of effectiveness on your landscape. But please do keep an eye on this because it does just take one day for a deer to um, get to make some good damage on your landscape plants. Here we have some other simple methods in which we can deter deer. Uh, one is the let's hang some Irish spring soap on your trees or even create shavings and put them in bags and hang them through your shrubs. The recommended distance between this is about 10 feet on center um, and that should be enough to uh, deter the deer. Again, this might need to be replaced uh, somewhere along the line once or twice during the, the winter time should the uh, fragrances minimize with weather conditions. Another means in which to deter deer from even coming close to your, your landscape plants is by human hair. And humans, again, are seen as predators. And if they smell human hair, they're going to want to stay as far away as possible. Uh, the human hair retains its uh, fragrance for a shorter amount of time than any of these other um, methods here. So probably these would have to be replaced about every two weeks or so. And uh, if you have a good relationship with a barber shop or a hairdresser's, um, perhaps that would be one option for you to use. And again, you can put these in bags or just um, sprinkle it around the base of your plants. These are a little bit more sophisticated, motion detective devices and ultrasonic frequencies, but um, are utilized on a regular basis, especially for larger areas. The uh, motion detective devices are going to um, obviously detect the motion and then create some kind of um, reaction that is to deter the deer or scare them away. One would be a sound um, that would be emanating from that mechanism. Another would be lights and another might be a spray of water. There's been a number of uh, different detection devices that are used like that. The good thing is they work. The bad thing is, after a while, the deer get used to them and realize that there really isn't any true threat. So um, these might be useful for a short while, uh, but not consistently. The ultrasonic frequencies um, are me mechanisms that actually put out these very high-pitched noises that, in theory, humans aren't supposed to hear, but some people can hear them. Um, and they can be set at different frequencies to deter different animals. And as you, this illustration indicates, you know, we're looking at anything from bats to bears. I know that it's very effective with controlling porcupine damage on a lot of uh, second homes here in the Catskill area. So uh, I would say that this would be something that would not wear off with time with the deer. Well, exclusion is one of probably the best ways in which we can prevent deer browsing or deer grazing on our plants. And here we have a number of various uh, materials that are being used. Uh, the upper left-hand corner is a couple using a couple of stakes and some plastic bird netting. On the bottom left-hand side, we actually have some metal netting with some stakes um, that's a little bit flimsier. And then on the right hand, upper right hand side, we have something of more of a permanent nature to prevent the grazing with larger stakes and uh, denser and thicker wires. These are all very good. They should be five to six feet high. Um, it can be higher if you um, get a lot of snow and you know that the deer will be able to be walking on that raised level earth. 
Um, and if you are looking to also prevent deer from a larger area, you might look into using electric fence. And with electric fence or perimeter fences to properties, those need to be much higher. Those are going to be anywhere from 10 to 12 feet, and they could almost be, as they do in um, large orchard areas, not only placed vertically, but placed on a slight angle to the exterior of the property so that the deer can't just jump over, but they might jump into the fence. Um, but you can look some of those, those techniques and those uh, styles up. But again, um, ways in which we can prevent deer damage is exclusion and very effective. Here we have uh, an opportunity, potential opportunity to uh, minimize deer grazing while also uh, decorating our front home for the holidays. And with these new holiday lights, which come in a woven uh, wire fabric, the deer are going to be less likely to graze on these shrubs. Now, again, we're looking at their sensitive noses and not that these are going to be providing any kind of smell, but their noses don't like anything that is sharp or three dimensional and these lights and the wires would be brushing up against their noses, noses and they would be less likely to be grazing on these, especially the smaller and the finer the weaving of those wires would be. So um, a great idea, which also has some ornamental value. The next item that we might want to discuss here is the prevention of rabbit damage. And rabbit damage can sometimes look similar to deer damage in that the rabbits will graze on the lower branches of evergreens. And for some reason, the arborvitae, this plant on the right-hand side, just seems to be um, a favorite plant of both deer and rabbits. Uh, the rabbit damage will not be seen as high as the deer unless you have a lot of snow and then you have the rabbits being able to, again, get to higher elevations because they're on top of the snow. On the left-hand side would be more of your typical rabbit damage um, indications by the lack of bark. Rabbits, when they no longer have food that they can eat, they look to um, be able to survive on the bark on the shrubs. And so they will just girdle or eat away all the bark around the entire stems. And uh, this unto itself will, the bark itself protects the growing um, cells beneath there, which allow the plant to absorb moisture and um, from its roots. And so if we take away those, that ability, then the plant will die on the top and the damage is done. So when you see girdling around an entire stem or a tree trunk, um, that typically indicates that you're um, going to have a very uh, unhealthy plant, if not dead by the next year, or the next spring. Voles are also creatures that can wreak havoc by girdling our plant materials. They're cute and adorable, have those big brown eyes. Um, they are very active. They're active year round. They're active day and night. They continue to reproduce day and night. And what's really um, probably to their benefit is in the wintertime, they are much more able to hide from predators because they, they tunnel under the snow. And so if you ever see some of those tunnels in the snow, that's really what is causing it is, are these voles. They often will live in a mole hole. And so people will blame the mold on doing it, but it's really not the mold's fault. The molds are eating grubs. The voles are eating vegetation. They're vegetarians. And um, one of the indications of bowl damage is that they actually create these little side-by-side -side grooves by their sharp teeth that are about an inch, a quarter of an inch wide. So um, they'll, you'll see this damage very close to the ground, probably within the top four or six inches maybe from the ground on some of your trees and shrubs that have been covered by snow or leaves or mulch. So they like to hide from their predators. How do we exclude some of these um, pests? Well, we can put wraps around trees. And what is most obvious about these wraps is that they're not solid, that they have some type of um, means in which the stems of the plants can still um, obtain oxygen, which is required for their health. And um, they come in different colors and sizes and shapes. The smaller 
pieces here are going to be good for your rabbits and your voles. The taller um, the pieces here are going to be much um, better at protecting from larger and taller predators, including beavers. Um, sometimes they will also come into your landscape or for deer rubs, but um, to know that some of them are even some ornamental looking uh, types of covers like this one on the right hand side that looks a bit like wrought iron and not only will it protect your tree trunk from the uh, pests but also from string trimmers and uh, machinery so could have some dual purposes there we can also try to protect our plants from snow and ice damage um, again we know we're going to get snow some years are worse than others some of us are more susceptible to getting the heavy snows or ice storms, but regardless, our climate is changing as our storms are. And that is something that we want to consider prior to the winter time by preparing our plants um, properly so they are not going to succumb to some of these, these heavy snows and ice damage where they just will split their limbs and then again be deformed or um, potentially die from that that storm. And many times these happen in the middle of the night. So we're not necessarily going to be all that anxious to go outside and shake off all this heavy snow, or if we can't even do that. So what can we do? Well, there are some plants that are going to definitely be more susceptible to this type of damage. So number one, perhaps you don't want to even plant those plants. Some trees are more susceptible because they have weaker crotches or they're fast growing. But then we have other plants such as this, like these evergreens that have very, very fine and closely spaced um, branches and they hold on to the snow. And if they are pruned in such a fashion that they don't shed the snow, say they're rounded or flat topped, um, they the weight will accumulate and will split those plants apart. So one of the recommendations to prevent some of this would be the illustrations shown on the right hand side. One would be taking some twine and wrapping it around the exterior of the plant. Again, you don't have to you know, make this extremely tight. You wanna probably leave it a little bit on the loose side because this way the plant will be able to get, you're not suffocating the insides of the plant, you're being able to get some oxygen in there. If you don't care for that appearance, um, you can go to the inside of the canopy and tie together some of the main branches and try to provide a form on a plant that is also able to shed some of the snow. So a pointed top or plants that have wider bases as opposed to the top will lessen the opportunity for a, a snow load to happen on the top and then open up that plant. We can also cover some of these plants that are susceptible to this type of snow load and ice damage. Uh, some of them are going to be prefabricated uh, covers, some of them more of like a canvasy material, some of them more of a netting material. And as the one in the middle on the top shows, it even has some holiday lights. So it could be again, a decorative element. Um, these are, and you can see even these shapes themselves are forming a pyramid on the top to assist in the snow not accumulating on their tops. On the bottom left-hand corner, we have some homemade um, protective wooden teepees that go over the plant materials. And what's really nice about these is they're on hinges and they have like a chain so that the plant, the, the, the little framework cannot get too wide or um, be flattened by the snow load. And then when they're finished being used, you can um, pick them up and they will flatten down into a, a flat shape so they can be stored and, and uh, placed on top of each other. On the right hand side, it looks like there's a little bit more effort involved, but um, apparently for this particular uh, location, this is what is needed. Um, a wooden framework that will have some type of covering, protected covering put over it so that these plants are not going to suffer from the, the weight of the snows and ice that might be coming off the roof of that house or just from weather situations, from, from storms. Thank you, Brigetta. I'm going to share with you how to winterize your lawn. Everyone wants a nice, green, dense, green lawn like this one in the picture. 
To get your lawn looking like that, there's a few things that you can do this fall that will help you in the process. One of the obvious things that you can do is fertilize your lawn. However, make sure that you check with your local extension offices for laws and regulations. Here in New York State, we cannot apply anything after October 1st. Fall is, however, one of the best and most important times to fertilize your lawn because it gives your grass a chance to build up some stamina from the hot heat of the summer before the chilly winter months set in. Supporting that root growth in the fall leads to that healthier, greener lawn in the spring. Fall's morning dew also delivers moisture to help absorb up the fertilizer, which is a good thing. Another thing that we can do is overseed our lawn. We simply do that by broadcasting more grass seed over your existing turf. Rule of thumb is the thicker your grass stand, the harder it is for weeds to get established, giving you a uniform look. So if you don't already have a thick turf sand, you probably want to oversee. The way we do that is we mow, and then we use a spring rake to break up and remove the layer of dead matted grass, known as the thatch, and then add the grass seed. This will allow the grass seed to reach the soil bed for germination. Some people think about adding a layer of topsoil to protect the seed from hungry birds or from blowing away. However, the small seeds cannot force their way through the heavy earth, and so a topsoil layer suffocates your seed before it even has a chance to grow. Therefore, you do not want to add anything to the grass seed. Just simply put it straight onto the existing turf. Another thing that you want to do is trimming your turf shorter. It is good practice about a month before the growing season ends to begin lowering your mowing heights. Ultimately, you want to get your lawn around two inches high by winter time. That's what we consider the sweet spot because it's not too tall to invite snow molds and it's not too short to stress out for the cold weather. If your grass is left long during the winter, the grass basically bends over because of the weight of the snow and or rain, and it traps cool moisture that quickly breeds winter fungal disease, such as the one pictured. That is snow mold in our region, and come spring, you will be left with this weakened turf and this cobweb-looking mycelium on the turf surface after snow melt. Speaking, speaking of after the snow melt, if your turf stand up too high, it can also become a breeding ground for mice. Since mice do not hibernate and remain active throughout the winter, the taller grass acts as an insulator and keeps the soil temperatures a little bit warmer. Come spring, you will have damage, as seen in this picture, as they have tunneled through the lawn destroying the roots and pushing up the crowns of the plants. Lastly, with fall comes the fall leaves from the trees. Although they're fun to jump in and give you some color, you want to make sure that you remove the leaves from your yard or mulch them up well within the with the lawnmower. Leaving leaves on the yard throughout the winter will lead to damage or disease lawns in the spring. If you follow some of these tips and tricks, your lawn will come out of the winter strong and will set you up for the next lawn care season. So now that we've learned what we can do to help our trees and shrubs and our lawns manage the winter season, I'd like to address our flowers. And in this section, I'd like to talk about our perennials. And so we're going to learn about putting our perennials to bed for the winter time. Cleaning our perennial beds for the winter can be a little bit of a tedious chore, but what's um, beneficial about it is it can minimize our work in the subsequent spring, as well as prevent some future uh, diseases and insect infestations in our gardens. So once we've had a good frost, 
and the plants start entering into their dormant period, it's very wise for us to take our pruning shears or some uh, loppers and start cutting down any of the old flowers and seed heads, removing any of the brown uh, leaf material and uh, start cleaning everything up in there that might be organic because the organic material can retain some of our pesty insects and diseases. They can overwinter in those stems and then re-emerge in the springtime, uh, reinfecting our plants. Other things that we can do for our perennial bed is to get rid of some of the weeds. Uh, some of the weeds are going to be perennial themselves, and if we're able to uh, remove them now, we're going to have less of a weed pressure the subsequent growing season. Uh, during our time in the garden, we might be also interested in overwintering some of our tender perennials, uh, some of the things that have corms or bulbs to them or gladiolars or dahlias and things of that nature. And the last thing that we would probably want to do after we've removed all of the existing organic matter is then add a little bit again in the form of mulch. And that mulch is going to be very useful in minimizing the freeze-thaw action that happens during the winter time because the sun beats down on that nice dark soil, it warms it up, it thaws it out, and then at nighttime when the temperatures drop, it freezes. And that freeze-thaw cycle wreaks havoc with our plants, their roots in particular, which is the area where they're storing their foods for the subsequent growing season. So adding some clean mulch, which doesn't have then any of the uh, diseases or insects that were you know, in the garden from earlier in the year, some brand new mulch is very useful in, in providing not only the, the minimization of that freeze-thaw effect, but also providing uh, a way in which we can retain moisture to those roots. So these are all very useful things to do to our perennial bed. Here you see a gentleman cleaning out his perennial bed and he's cutting back all the plant materials to the ground and it looks in the back now with that tarp, he's going to be hauling it away. But you can leave the material in place. As I've mentioned before, the stems and the leaves may harbor pests, either egg masses or larvae. But um, we don't only have pests in those pieces of plant material, we also may have some beneficials. So um, leaving them there and allowing the plant material to be its own form of mulch you know, is an option for you. Um, if you don't always have to take it away in the fall time and um, this would work just as well as adding a new layer of mulch. And although I've mentioned now about cleaning your perennial beds in the fall time, not everybody does it in the fall and nor is it necessary per se to do it in the fall. Um, we can also allow the perennial beds to remain in place for the winter time the perennials come um, pre-programmed to overwinter on their own. Um, they, you know, unless a, an animal grazes them, but for the most part, perennials are, are good at maintaining themselves in the winter without that cutting back. And what this allows uh, the gardener to do is appreciate some of those seed heads and the sculptural qualities of the plants during the winter time. The uh, photograph on the right shows some snow on the, um, the sedums that were growing the year before. And the uh, plants themselves wind up also insulating their bottom pieces and minimizing that freeze-thaw effect. So this, uh, this can be an opportunity for you, especially don't feel bad if you don't get to it in the fall time. Uh, the, the downside to this is it's just going to be work that's waiting for you in the springtime because you will want to cut everything back in the springtime to allow the new growth from the basal rosettes from the existing perennials, okay? And here we also see some of the perennials. Now this might look a little bit weedy, because it is. There's a number, I have layers in my garden. This happens to be my garden. And on the left-hand side, we have Johnny jump ups that have receded themselves amongst the um, fading and going dormant uh, peonies. And then there's a yucca plant. So I, I sometimes like a little bit more of a wild look. So if uh, it's, if it's a wild look you're looking for, you can also go along with this uh, methodology. On the right-hand side, I'm illustrating some evergreen perennials, and these happen to be Lenten roses, and they will remain evergreen and will utilize these leaves in the wintertime and very early spring to photosynthesize when they are going to be putting on their new flowers. 
So um, that would be important for you not to remove things that are evergreen, uh, including even that yucca on the left. Those leaves are meant to be there for the winter time, so don't cut them back just yet or at all in the winter time. And if you're concerned about um, insect and uh, disease pressure from leaving some of these plants in place, um, just understand too that there are beneficials that are staying along with the plant. So um, it just is going to be a matter of choice, but these are some of the ways in which you can prepare your perennials for the winter. Many of you may have dahlias in your perennial gardens as they are a nice choice of plant material that adds color and continues throughout the growing season. Unfortunately, these perennials are what we call tender perennials and won't withstand the harsh cold winters. So in order to save these perennials for the next growing year, you must dig them up and store them over the winter. We do that by waiting until the frost hits and blackens their foliage, like the picture on the left. Once that occurs, we can cut the foliage off to about four inches from the tuber. That allows you to figure out how big the tuber is and to easily dig them out. After they are removed from the ground, you want to carefully knock off as much dirt as possible, cut down the stems to about two inches above the tuber and let them dry out for many days in a frost-free area out of the direct sun. Once dried, they will be ready to store for the winter. Move the tuber into a ventilated box or basket lined with newspaper. It's okay to stack them one on top of each other and place in a fairly dark, dry, and roughly uh, 45 to 55 degree location. An unheated basement works really well. Occasionally throughout the winter, you want to check in on them to make sure that the location is suitable, meaning it's not too moist or too dry. Um, if your tubers are beginning to shrivel up, they are getting too dry and you will want to add a little bit of water with a spray bottle or something like that. And same holds true with uh, the other way. If the location is too moist and the tubers are staying too wet, um, they could form mold and, be, and begin rotting. So you will want to relocate them to a drier location or spread them out. When spring arrives and the ground temperatures reach about 60 degrees, you can then replant them once again in your garden. Or if you want to get a jump start, you can plant the tubers in buckets and begin inside. And of course, get ready to have another beautiful flower show all season long. We know that we've thrown a lot of information at you already, but a couple of other things to think about as you prepare for the winter months. At the end of the season, when everything is drying off and looking sad, it's very tempting to just rip everything out and churn or till the dirt so it looks all pretty and fresh. Heck, it's a jump start for the next growing season, right? In our area, actually, it does more harm than good. When you churn the soil, you are not only bringing weed seeds and beneficial insects up from the soil bed and exposing them, you are possibly introducing more fungal spores and eggs that will overwinter for the next season. So you ultimately are loosening up good topsoil which will easily dry out and possibly blow off site, and you're harming your beneficials that already live in your soil. The better thing to do would be remove as much of the spent plants from the soil surface and possibly add some organic matter like manure. By adding these additions now, they will have time to start breaking down, enriching your soil, and becoming biologically effective become spring. Speaking of organic matter, we don't want to forget about our compost piles, if you have one. To keep those microbes working a bit longer and to keep them warm and insulated throughout the winter months, you want to build up your compost heap with plenty of autumn leaves, straw, or sawdust, 
layered with kitchen scraps and other active green material. This will insulate and protect those microbes as well as give them something to feed on all winter long. Remember, you can continue to add your kitchen scraps to your compost pile throughout the winter months. The freeze-thaw cycles will help to break down the materials that you are adding so they will in fact decompose even faster when spring arrives. Water. Water. We all know how crucial it is for plants to survive on water. If we give plants too much water, well, they rot and die. If we don't water them enough, then they can struggle and ultimately die. I know what you're thinking. It's the end of the season, and the last thing you want to do is keep watering your garden. But really, you need to. Throughout the landscape, plants are preparing for the winter. The days get shorter, signaling, signaling that it's time to drop their leaves. Frost zaps many perennials back to the ground. So plants are busy storing sugars and other nutrients in their roots to sustain them through the tough winter months. To support plants through these seasons of transition, we need to make sure that they get adequate water until the ground freezes. This is especially important if the summer season has been hot and dry and or for newly planted tree shrubs and perennials. It is true that in the fall, plants do not need as much water as they may have needed in the summer but rather than stop watering altogether, it's best to wean your plants slowly. So maybe from a weekly watering to an every other week watering to a monthly watering cycle. The most important thing to grasp here is not to put your sleepy, thirsty plants. You expect to survive the winter. Believe it or not, water is a great protectant for your plants against frost. Obviously, there will be a time that we do stop watering and we need to remember to drain and put away our hose so they don't freeze, crack, or potentially cause issues. Like in the picture. Mulching in the winter has many of the same benefits as summer mulching. These include reducing water loss, protecting the soil from erosion, and inhibiting weeds. But winter mulching has other benefits as well. As the soil is transitioning to colder weather, the freezing and thawing of the earth can adversely affect our garden plants, whose roots suffer from all of that churning and heaving. Adding a thick layer of mulch to the soil surface helps regulate the soil temperatures and moisture to ease within that transition into winter. Trust me, your plants will thank you. If you want early flower color in the spring, now is the time to plant spring bulbs from September well into late autumn. For most spring bulbs, September or October is the ideal time to plant, but basically until the green freezes. In fact, it's best to wait until November to plant tulips as it reduces their risk of viruses. Please don't assume that cold winter temperatures will wipe out pests over the winter. Many insects, in fact, overwinter as adults pupate or eggs. This can be done inside buildings, under tree bark, beneath fallen leaves, plant material on the ground, among other places. All such overwintering sites shield the insects from adverse conditions associated with the winter. Most species have learned to adapt and will return with a vengeance in the spring. It's most important to pick up and be tidy. And your tools. Although most gardeners know they should keep tools clean and well oiled throughout the year, it's difficult to keep up with the task when gardening is in full swing. So fall is a great time to rejuvenate your tools. Lifespan by giving them some attention. Begin by washing your tools to remove the dirt and debris. If rust is present, 
Try to remove as much as possible with sandpaper and or a wire brush. You can sharpen hoes and shovels with your basic mill file and a wood stone works well for sharpening your pruning shears. Finally, rub the surfaces of your tools with an oiled rag coated in light machine oil. This will help seal the metal from oxygen and extend your tools life for another year. This concludes the formal presentation on how to winterize your garden. Once again, we are very pleased you joined us. We would now like to open up the question and answer session regarding this subject or possibly any other outdoor garden and plant related question that you may have. So thank you again. We hope you enjoyed that and it's nice to see some more folks were able to come on and join us. Um, welcome to um, Brigitte Brophy who helped put today's presentation together. Um, if you missed the beginning of this slide, uh, Birgitta is a faculty in our Golf and Plant Sciences program. And um, you're f uh, feel free to ask any questions you have. You can put them in the chat. Or if you'd like to unmute your mic, um, you can just ask them right out loud if you wish. Anyone have any questions? We really enjoyed your video, um, Birgitta. Um, do you oh. have any final thoughts or comments um, for us? I, I don't know, I was speaking with a few of our alumni before we started. I know we have a couple of folks here right from New York State, um, Long Island area, and I think Daryl's from the uh, Cherry Valley area. Um, I don't know if any of our other attendees today are from other regions um, of the country, if they have anything particular to ask or comment on in terms of gardening in, in their zones. Well, I guess the one thing I would say to um, anybody who is in gardening and maybe more so those newbies to the gardening uh, world is that we need to be, a, I guess, a little bit more on alert as to uh, the things that are changing in our climate, whereas we used to get uh, more consistent uh, rains and um, uh, temperatures that, you know, uh, weren't as variable. It seems as though our, our, our climate and our uh, our storm systems are changing a bit. So I think we need to be a little bit uh, better prepared for some of those things. I know that in this situation, um, some of, for us anyways, we have to look at a little bit of drought, you know, or irrigation systems so that we can uh, supplement some of the water. We have greater dry periods and then we have uh, heavier downpours of water that really don't get absorbed in the, in the soils. They become more stormwater runoff. And, uh, you know, this idea of adding mulch and um, being prepared for some of these situations would be beneficial because it can be frustrating sometimes. Patience is definitely a virtue in gardening. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll ask one more time if anybody has any questions come to mind. I just want to take an opportunity too to thank everybody for being here this afternoon. I found this very enjoyable. Definitely learned some things myself. For instance, uh, watering uh, your your garden even into the um, coming winter months. Um, found it very interesting. And I don't know if anybody noticed, but I definitely noticed a variety of photos from campus and you pointed out um, some of the plantings our students did down at our clubhouse at the golf hat. Uh, course. So I hope folks enjoyed seeing a little of the local scenery as well. I see we do have a question on the chat there. Um, there was somebody asking about uh, using pine needles as mulch. You see that, Lucinda? So I um, yes. definitely can answer that question. Uh, pine needles are very good uh, for mulch, and especially if you have an abundance of them. The one thing that I would want to mention, though, is that the pine needles themselves um, may create more of an acidic um, situation in your soil. So by applying them when they're decomposing and the rains hit them, the acid that would be in the, the needles themselves will start percolating into your soil so that um, depending on what you're growing or what you're where you're using this mulch, may, uh, you may want to be able to sweeten your soil if it becomes too acidic and make sure you're testing your pH. But if you're growing ericaceous plants or plants that do appreciate more of that acidic soil, it's, it's a perfect mulch for that. 
So yeah, good, good question. And uh, we call and and down south they use that often. It's called pine straw down there. So it's a beautiful. I, I think it's a very beautiful and soft type of mulch. And if you have easy access to it, go for it. Um, also, rain and snow falling and melting not enough. Oh, okay. Well, um, you know, we haven't had a lot of snow. So um, I don't know how much we can always uh, utilize the snow and the snowfall uh, to start preparing our soils when it does melt um, to form that nice moisture base in our soils. Um, but um, also, if we don't have enough snow, what I'm going to say, too, is there's a couple of problems here. Number one, it's not going to be, uh, re, you know, getting back into our uh, underwater, under, underground aquifers. It might not be creating a nice base for this, the moisture in our soils. But also, if we have what they call an open winter where it's snow free, the depth to frost in our soils get much greater. And um, that whole idea of that freeze thaw cycle becomes greater as well. So um, the, the lack of snow can actually be problematic and can cause damage because a lot of plants themselves might be hardy above the ground to cold temperatures, their roots may not be. So um, having additional, having that or lack of snow can be problematic for some of the plants that we have. So, um, yeah. So what month do you stop watering? I would say you stop watering uh, when the ground freezes. I know I, I have planted some, re, uh, some trees this year. The summer was very dry. And as Julia was mentioning earlier, you want to start weaning your plants off from the rain, from, you know, um, from watering them, but you still want to make sure that you have like an inch of water accessible to the plants per week. That's what the typical um, rule of thumb is. So if the ground is thawed and you're not getting any kind of natural rainfall, I would try to supplement that with a good watering at least once a week. And I'm going to be continuing to do that to my apple trees that I planted. Okay. We graduated in 1983, so we're happy. Okay. Is there anything we can do, Brigitte, to help save the bees with our gardening? Um, I would, you know, there's a lot of information put out right now about um, pollinator and pollinator gardens. And I know that in the industry itself, that there are a lot of people who are pushing um, certain plants. But I have been reading more recently, and I agree with this, is that diversity is key. So, um, you know, it's great to be able to um, provide, you know, plants that we know are tried and true, but that any plant is going to probably be able to provide some form of nectar for a variety of, of our pollinators. And um, just to make sure that we, we have that variety, we have a continuous bloom throughout the summertime, you know, oral seasons, springtime. And that's why planting bulbs can be very important is that might be some of the first uh, nectar that our pollinators can get before some of the other flowers and trees and shrubs start flowering. So just having that, you know, sequence of bloom from early spring to late fall as much as you can would be very good for our pollinators. Thanks. Any, any other questions? Well, thank you again, everyone. And again, to you, Brigitte, you and Julia so much for putting that together for us um, today. And um, we wish everybody uh, well and hope that we'll see everyone back on the Delhi campus. Um, Brigetta and her um, colleagues and our students do a really nice job keeping the plannings on campus looking beautiful. And I know I always really appreciate that. So hope you can all come and see it for yourselves soon. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye. -bye.